today about real-time observations of transformations in steels. Real-time means that you observe as a transformation is actually happening, and also to explain why we need to do this on some occasions. And many of you will already have actually experienced uh, real-time observations. For example, when you use a dilatometer or a calorimeter, you're actually making measurements while the transformation is happening. Now, as uh, uh, some of you have already said, uh, metals are extremely important. You know, there, there's about uh, 1.6 billion tons of metals produced every year, of which the vast majority is steel. And you wouldn't be able to produce uh, medicines, uh, you wouldn't be able to produce computers or anything that modern civilization relies on without steels. So why are they so incredibly successful? Well, one of the reasons is that there's an awful lot of manipulation that you can do of the structure of steel. There are literally thousands of phase transformations, some of which are summarized on, on this slide. And uh, I say some of this because I'm not, for example, talking about uh, carbides, intermetallic compounds, nitrides, and many other uh, precipitation reactions that happen in steels. So someone once told me there are 300,000 alloys of iron. And the reason is, of course, they are so useful and you can manipulate their properties. For example, strength going from 50 uh, megapascals to something like seven gigapascals. So you can find a steel for almost any application, whether it is in computer disks or in cars or in huge uh, projects like the construction of a long bridge. Now, obviously, this is a very big subject. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on this, this region alone because um, there are lots and lots of confusing aspects with the Bainite transformation and Martinsite transformation. If you go back about 50 years, there were huge debates on this subject. Now, I can't actually um, comment on everything that has happened. Uh, so I would recommend that you download uh, these books from my website. They are free to download and they contain a lot more detail about what I'm going to talk about today and much more. So they are freely available from the website that's listed over here. And just to illustrate to you what Bainite is, uh, here is a transmission electron micrograph of uh, a collection of Bainite plates. So the individual plates here are about a quarter of a micrometer in thickness, and they are separated here by films of austenite. <coughs> so this is like a, a natural composite with very, very fine crystals of bainitic ferrite separated by thin films of austenite, which actually help to improve the overall mechanical properties. If I look at this uh, using an optical microscope, uh, then you'll see that in addition to these thin films of austenite, you also have um, these big blocks of austenite in between those collections of plates. So on an optical scale, it's not possible to resolve the individual place that I showed in the previous microgram. Now, this has been an enormously uh, successful uh, microstructure, and indeed, as you will see later, a nanostructure. And by eliminating the cementite that usually happens uh, along with the bainite, uh, there have been many new concepts in steels developed. And I'm not going to go into the applications of this microstructure because today I want to focus on the fundamental science. But just to give you an idea, uh, someone has already mentioned the carbide-free rails that have enormous rolling contact fatigue resistance and wear resistance, and which are installed, for example, in the channel tunnel between England and France. And in this movie, um, you can see 
the enormous wear resistance of the microstructure. So this is the steel being hit against granite particles, and it's a slow motion movie. This is actually rotating at 300 RPM, and yet, you know, it has, it resists the wear, the abrasion from that. This slide shows another concept uh, which has led to shafts for civil aircraft engines. Okay, so civil aircraft engines are really big, and these shafts have to tolerate uh, uh, incredible pain inside the air aircraft engine. And this is a new alloy that we have developed for Rolls Royce in the UK. Over here, you can see a steel developed with Tata Steel, actually, uh, on uh, uh, for blast resistance. Blast means you have a sudden uh, loading, but the loading is not like a bullet. It's, it's spread out over, over a distance. And here is a simulation of, uh, of the blast by firing aluminum foil against the steel to see whether it resists that blast. And this uh, aluminum foam uh, is fired at a high velocity so that we can monitor everything that happens, including the deflection. And here is the ballistic resistance. That means when you fire a, a bullet or something at a high velocity, at an armor. This also is uh, bainitic, but it's a nanostructured bainite. And finally, if you look at these bearings, very large bearings that are used uh, for wind turbines, for example, then the rolling elements here are made from this nanostructured bainite. So all of these applications came about from very basic studies into the mechanism of the transformations. Uh, so if you want to develop something that is completely new, and all of these examples are completely new, with radically different structures and properties than ever achieved before. So if you want to do that, you've got to go into the fundamentals, as was mentioned by some of the speakers earlier. You've got to look at the atomic mechanisms of transformation. So, um, Going on to the mechanism by which a transformation happens, uh, we need to investigate how the atoms move and to express their behavior quantitatively, put it into equations and computer programs so, so that we can design steels rather than develop them empirically. And you notice that these plates of bainite are actually very thin plates in three dimensions. And the reason why they are thin plates is because you start with austenite and you deform its crystal uh, structure into that of ferrite. And the deformation is something like this, that you started off with a square pattern of atoms and you now got a different arrangement of atoms. So we've achieved a change in crystal structure by a physical deformation that is driven by the chemical free energy change. Now, this obviously is a schematic representation of that deformation, which is a shear and a volume change. I'm going to show you next a real-time observation of the shape deformation happening as bainite grows from austenite. And the observations use a technique known as uh, confocal laser microscopy, which has a resolution roughly the same as an optical microscope. So here uh, we have a sample of austenite, which is completely flat, and you can see the austenite grain boundaries. And as soon as uh, we allow the sample to cool from the austenizing temperature, you can see that bainite forms and causes an upheaval of the surface, a very specific upheaval of the surface, which is known as an invariant plane strain with a large shear component and a volume change normal to the plane of the plate. Now, this has enormous consequences because it's a, it's a large deformation, causes a lot of strain energy, and that is why the plates are in the form of very thin objects, because that helps to accommodate that strain. Now, uh, I want you to notice the scale here. This is about 50 micrometers. So what we are observing is really not the formation of individual plates, but clusters of plates. So 
from these observations, you cannot actually work out the growth rate of an individual plate. If you wanted to do that, you would need to use another technique, which I'll come back to later. Now, just to contrast this with transformations which involve a lot of diffusion, okay? for example, the growth of perlite or, or ferrite, I will show you a similar observation done at the University of Tokyo, where you transform a flat sample of austenite into ferrite, allotromorphic ferrite. So this is uh, austenite to begin with, and it's a polished flat, and it's going to transform into the ferrite that's illustrated over here. And when I start this movie, it's an extremely boring movie because as the sample cools, you see no change at all. There are no upheavals produced because when you get diffusion, uh, you eliminate any strain energies, and that's the advantage of diffusional transformations, is that they are much closer to equilibrium than the displacive transformation that I talked about earlier. They're much closer to equilibrium, but they can only happen at high temperatures where diffusion is possible. Okay? So you see that there is no change in the surface, uh, because the diffusion fluxes eliminate the development of strain energy. Atomic mobility is essential for these transformations, and atomic mobility simply isn't there as far as the ion atoms are concerned uh, for the displacive transformations such as bainite or martensite. Now, many, many years ago, uh, there was a theory that if you look at the distribution of carbon in austenite, it starts off homogeneous, but then you develop carbon poor and carbon rich regions within the austenite before any phase transformation. Okay. And as a consequence of that, uh, you get the transformation to bainite or martensite happening in these carbon depleted regions. Okay, so this is a, a very powerful statement that before any transformation, you actually get carbon rich and carbon poor regions developing in the austenite uh, on, on a sufficiently large scale. And that gives locations where the bainite transformation can happen. And here are some, uh, some papers which go back you know, to the first suggestion, which was by Kojimo in 1933 and uh, some of the later work in 2005 and there have been a number of papers after that which I haven't listed. So the idea is that austenite separates into carbon rich and carbon depleted regions and then it is the depleted regions that initiate transformation into ferrite. So it's a very strange idea uh, which doesn't have any experimental uh, backup to support the idea. And therefore, there is an awful lot of speculation. Now, let's first of all look at how this might happen. So imagine that we are looking at austenite. Uh, it will spontaneously develop carbon rich and carbon poor regions. This is a computer simulation of chromium, in fact, not of carbon, all right, because the iron chrome system actually behaves in exactly the same way as I suggested for carbon. And this is what happened in the universe when after the Big Bang, you know, there was uh, about 100 million years where there was no clustering of matter. So there was no light at all in the sky because the light comes from stars, which can only happen after you've got a large amount of matter clustering. Initially, there were about 100 million years of dark ages with no light at all in the universe. And it's the same sort of mechanism that we're talking about. This is a computer simulation of the universe by a colleague of mine, uh, which is about the clustering of matter. So what we are saying is that, look, we start off completely homogeneous, austenite, and inside the austenite, we spontaneously develop composition waves with carbon depleted and carbon enriched regions, and those composition waves grow in amplitude, 
And this is the classical description of spinodal decomposition, okay? So this is a, a theoretical possibility, but when you look at it in detail, it requires a particular kind of free energy surface to give you a spontaneous decomposition into carbon rich and carbon poor regions. So if I plot, for example, here, the um, iron chromium um, free energy plot at a particular temperature, uh, it could have a shape which is like this, or it could have a shape which is like this. Okay. Now, if you get a free energy shape, a uh, free energy curve with a shape like this, and I take a particular composition, it can spontaneously decompose into composition poor and composition rich regions with a reduction in free energy. Okay, so nothing can happen spontaneously if there isn't a reduction in free energy. But if you have a curve of this shape, then that is not possible because the development of carbon uh, of chromium poor and chromium rich regions would lead to an increase in free energy. So the fundamental requirement, thermodynamic requirement for the austenite developing carbon rich and carbon poor regions is that you must have a free energy curve as a function of carbon, which has this shape. And back in 1966, Aronson, Domian, and Pound showed that in fact for austenite, the free energy curve is of this shape. So it's actually impossible for austenite to undergo spinodal decomposition. Nevertheless, there were still uh, arguments that maybe, you know, at low temperatures, the free energy curve uh, that we have in our thermodynamic databases may not be correct. Okay, so we decided to investigate the state of the austenite in real time before transformation happens. And this is by doing an experiment at the Argonne uh, National Laboratory's Advanced Photon Source in the USA. Um, this, this was the work that we did, where you, know, you can start with a specimen which is red hot, uh, in other words, austenitic, and then cool it and allow transformation to happen isothermally and monitor using x-rays in what phases are forming, okay? And what are their lattice parameters? Because if there is a variation of carbon, then you would also get a variation in lattice parameters. And unfortunately, uh, this work uh, was of a poor resolution. You can see from the image over here that uh, you know the information is very bitty here. In other words, we are getting spots from individual grains rather than from within just a single grain. And we were really not happy with this work. So we decided that you know, if we want to repeat this experiment, we would need much greater resolution. Okay? So basically, we were very unhappy with this work, which we did ourselves. And the reason is, you know, if I if I have a hypothetical X-ray profile like this, which actually has two peaks, because we are looking for two peaks for the carbon poor and carbon depleted regions, then with a low resolution, you would mix up the information. Uh, and this is a separate problem from the fact that we had very bitty observations, right? You know, you saw spots instead of nice rings. But if you increase the resolution of your experiment, then there isn't much of a change from reality to actually what you measure. So we repeated the experiment uh, in Grenoble. So Grenoble is the European synchrotron radiation facility uh, with this famous uh, 850 meters circumference ring uh, with superconducting mag magnets all around where electrons are accelerated in this ring uh, to very high velocities. And because this is curved, okay, um, curvature means you are, you are changing momentum, and therefore you also emit X-rays from these, and you can pull off these X-rays from various locations on that ring and do experiments in this region. You, you have a, 
uh, room effectively here, which is receiving the X-rays, and you can do a whole variety of experiments. And there are many such so-called beam lines where you can tap these extremely high energy X-rays, much higher energy than uh, you would get in a normal uh, university laboratory, for example. The reason uh, have it for having these very high energy X-rays is that you can easily penetrate steel samples and you can record signals in small time intervals as opposed to running the experiment for several hours. So we want to actually measure the X-ray diffraction peaks as a function of time with small time steps and very good signal to noise ratio. So we repeated the experiments at uh, Grenoble. And uh, this is uh, our sample, which, uh, which was sealed inside a glass tube to prevent uh, oxidation. And we also included a platinum wire so that we can actually check the instrumental resolution. Okay. So this is uh, where the X-rays come in from the synchrotron uh, in that uh, room outside of the synchrotron, uh, outside of that circular object that I showed earlier. Here we have the specimen, and these are heaters blowing hot air so that we can ostentize the specimen and then transform it isothermally at a variety of temperatures. So the resolution of this setup we established using that platinum standard is 20 times better than the one experiment we did at the argon uh, advanced photon source. So this is the sort of information that you get as a time sequence. OK, so we are picking up uh, how the diffraction changes as a function of time. And I want you to notice two things. Uh, so I'll run this movie again. Uh, at the beginning, we have a peak from austenite, which is nice and symmetrical. That's exactly what you would expect, a symmetrical peak indicating a homogeneous composition. Uh, and as transformation proceeds, it becomes more and more asymmetrical. This is now the ferrite peak coming in. And look, uh, towards the end, it's highly asymmetrical. All right? And that is indicative of two peaks being present. Okay, so when you do careful analysis using the Readwell method and other techniques, uh, an asymmetrical peak arises because it is a combination of peaks. Furthermore, uh, with this technique, because we have such a high intensity, um, we can look at the volume fractions of these two regions of austenite plus the region of ferrite. So, you know, X-ray diffraction is a wonderful way of measuring volume fractions. So here is a plot, for example, of the how the amount of bainitic ferrite increases at 300 degrees centigrade and how the carbon poor austenite and carbon rich austenite changes as a function of time during the experiment. And these are very accurate measurements. So. This doesn't actually prove that the austenite changed into carbon rich and carbon poor regions as transformation proceeded. Because, you know, when bainite forms and it partitions carbon, there will be a carbon rich region around the bainite plate and away from the bainite plate, it will be poorer in austenite. So we need to look at the austenite before transformation has happened. So if I just go back a slide and look at this uh, peak over here. Uh, I can plot those peaks in a different different way on a color diagram which shows the intensity of the peak and the angle, diffraction angle of the peak. So here is uh, such a diagram. And here we have the one on one austenite peak and the 002 austenite peak. And this is the time sequence uh, that I illustrated earlier uh, at a constant temperature of about 300 degrees centigrade. And this is the 001, 011 ferrite peak, and this is the platinum standard. And you can see that the instrumental resolution is really good. Okay, The reason why the steel peaks are very broad is because, of course, this is a displacive transformation, and therefore you have strain contributing to the broadness of the peak. 
Now, notice over here, there is no change in the austenite lattice parameter before the onset of transformation, okay? Before the onset of transformation. And you only start to develop uh, the carbon rich and carbon poor regions once the bainite has formed because the partitioning of carbon from the bainite enriches the carbon adjacent to uh, in the austenite adjacent to the bainite but not far away from the austenite uh, okay now if i lower the transformation temperature i can slow this reaction down considerably and look at this region in uh, over a much longer period of time uh, so by reducing the transformation temperature to 200 degrees centigrade, again, you can see that there is absolutely no uh, development of carbon rich or carbon poor regions in the austenite, as might be indicated by getting two lattice parameters. So the problem is solved that you do not get spinodal decomposition in the austenite prior to its transformation into bainite. And since this work was published, uh, many other people have done similar experiments, either using a synchrotron or using a neutron diffraction in real time, and uh, confirm, confirm these results. And of course, uh, once you have transformed the material, you do get an inhomogeneous distribution of carbon. So if you look at the region around the bainite here, then the austenite is preserved because it has a high carbon concentration. But away from the bainite, you have the austenite decomposing into martensite when you cool. And these are atom probe data where we measure the non-uniform composition of the austenite once transformation has happened. Okay. So in conclusion, uh, with these real-time experiments, uh, we have solved a long-standing problem that there is no development of carbon-rich and carbon-poor regions in the austenite prior to transformation. Why is this of any consequence? Well, in all our mathematical models for designing steels and for predicting their properties, you need to have the mechanism of transformation, which is completely different if you actually have spinodal decomposition in the austenite prior to transformation. And without theory of that kind, it would take you years and years to empirically design steels. Uh, all the applications that I showed you earlier rely on theory of this kind to rapidly design steels and take them to commercial practice. Now, I mentioned to you earlier when I was showing you the confocal light microscopy that the resolution is not enough to look at the growth of individual plates. And, you know, the mechanism of bainite, which is now generally accepted, is that it's a displacive transformation where the bainite plates form exactly like martensite during their growth, and then partition carbon into the remaining austenite. Uh, if that is correct, then the growth rate of the bainite plates should be much greater than you would expect from diffusion control. So what is the growth rate of the individual plates? Uh, there are many papers published in the literature where they claim they are measuring the growth rate of bainite, but actually they are measuring the growth rate of a cluster of plates, which is which should be much slower. So the technique that we used uh, was photo emission electron microscopy, where you take a bulk sample and you shine uh, ultraviolet light onto that sample, and that causes it to emit uh, electrons which are then collected by the lenses of the electron microscope and you get a much higher resolution. And of course, uh, uh, you can heat the sample inside the microscope so that it's austenitic and then cool it until it reaches the appropriate transformation temperature. And I'm going to show you now the uh, results. Okay, so this is the confocal microscopy and I mentioned to you that the scale here is 50 micrometers. 50 micrometers, so it's not enough resolution to see individual plates growing. This is uh, from a photo emission electron microscope, and I'd like you to focus uh, on this region, and you can actually resolve individual platelets. Okay, so this is at zero seconds, and um, this is at one second where you see individual plates have grown, and 
two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. You can actually directly measure the growth rate of individual plates and show that it is three orders of magnitude faster than if carbon was diffusing during transformation. So everything fits. Yeah, the, the synchrotron work, much uh, many other experiments where you use thermodynamics and kinetic theory <coughs> to show the mechanism of transformation. Now, if a transformation happens rapidly, then there is another technique you can use. You should be able to hear the transformation with your own ears. And I'm going to illustrate this. So many of you will know that mechanical twinning is a rapid event. So for example, if I deform the steel using an explosive, then it will prefer to deform by twinning because that's a very rapid method of deforming the material. Uh, and I'm going to show you a piece of indium metal in which I will induce mechanical twinning and you will hear the twins happening. So this, these acoustic emissions only happen if something happens rapidly, okay? So this is a microphone and you will hear this yeah, crackling this sound. piece of indium metal, which I'm going to deform. And when it deforms, it does so by mechanical twinning. And every time a twin forms rapidly, we get an acoustic emission, which I will record with this microphone. So those acoustic emissions uh, were because in indium, one of the deformation modes is mechanical twinning. And indium is a really nice uh, material to illustrate this because if I put it into boiling water, it will anneal out and I can reuse it. Okay, if bainite is forming rapidly, we should get acoustic emissions and we know that we don't get acoustic emissions from perlite or ferrite. And I'm going to now um, uh, let you listen to acoustic emissions from bainite, which were recorded by Francisca in my in my group when she was uh, working on nanostructured bainite. So these are actual emissions coming from the formation of bainite. So the way she discovered this is she had placed a sample onto a, a large piece of uh, steel plate, a hot sample, which was transforming into bainite. And you know the plate itself magnified the acoustic emissions that were coming from the formation of bainite. So you can see that the story is consistent, that all the aspects that we expect from a displacive transformation actually happen. Yeah. Okay. So all this and the information that proves that bainite happens by the mechanism that I've explained, you can obtain from this book, which you can download from my website. And remember that the best theory is a theory which is quantitative and which you can actually use in design and make predictions. By predictions, what I mean is you predict something that has not existed before, okay? So, you know, uh, many, many people talk about a bainite start temperature and a bainite finish temperature. And one of the questions that we wanted to ask was, what is the lowest temperature at which we can get bainite? And we proved theoretically that there is no limit to the lowest temperature. And it's a matter of just avoiding martensitic transformation. 
And that is actually one of the key features of nanostructured bainite, where we transform, we design a steel that can transform at an incredibly low temperature, and therefore you get plates which are finer than carbon nanotubes. Now, I mentioned earlier on that uh, you are probably familiar with real-time experiments on a dilatometer. Okay, so this, this is a standard dilatometer. You put a sample in here, you have a system for heating the sample, and you measure dimensional changes uh, from which you can record a transformation actually happening. And, you know, for example, you have this particular specimen, which is a nuclear pressure vessel steel, cooled at a particular rate, and you can see there's a high temperature transformation followed by a low temperature transformation, and even a transformation at uh, a low temperature. Now, we were doing work to design welding alloys, which do not lead to distortion. And it was in the context of uh, welding submarine steels. Okay? So let me explain to you what the problem is. So imagine that we are making a weld between two pieces of steel. Initially, there's a gap here, which you fill with liquid metal. And the liquid, of course, can flow, so it's completely disconnected and doesn't cause any stresses. Eventually, the liquid solidifies. And when it solidifies, it contracts. So it's pulling on its surroundings. And that leaves a state of residual stress inside the weld, which has two consequences. The first consequence is that you, can, uh, you cannot load it to as high a load as you might want to, because there's already a stress inside your weld, which is there even if you don't apply any external load. And the second thing is that if your assembly is not constrained, then the whole thing will distort, right? So these, these plates will become at an angle because thermal contraction will cause them to move. So this is a big problem in the welding industry. And we thought of a method to compensate for this thermal contraction using phase transformations. And the idea actually comes from 1977, from the work of uh, Albury and Jones at the Central Electricity Generating Board. Now, they took a sample, which was fully austenitic, a tensile specimen, heated it up to a high temperature, and then held it rigidly, all right? And what happens is that thermal contraction causes an increase in stress. Okay, uh, this is completely austenitic even at room temperature. Now, supposing you use a different steel which transforms to bainite, then yes, we get the same behavior initially, but when transformation happens, you tend to cancel out that thermal contraction stress. But when transformation is finished, you rapidly build up the stress again. Okay, so that's that's not a useful thing to do. Uh, when they looked at an alloy which transforms at a lower temperature, same sort of behavior, but you are left with a lower level of stress because the transformation is not exhausted until a lower temperature is reached. So the idea is, you know, supposing that you can move this point here to ambient temperature, then you won't have any residual stress. So we decided to use dilatometry in which we monitor the stress, the volume fractions, the dimensional changes, and many other features at the same time to repeat these experiments with the alloys that we designed to transform at a low temperature and which also have many other properties that you need when you're making wells in critical applications. So, this is a, a special dilatometer which was designed and built, built for us, and it's installed in the Grenoble synchrotron. So there is an X-ray source uh, from the beam line. This is where the specimen would go, and we can get all the information that we want from the synchrotron and from the dilatometer in terms of stress and other features, okay, in real time. So the dilatometer can, of course, heat the sample in a controlled way and cool it in a controlled way and hold it isothermally and so forth. 
So here is uh, a typical experiment that we did. So uh, this is a plot of temperature versus time. And as this point moves along here, you'll see the X-ray diffraction pattern change. This is the room temperature X-ray diffraction pattern. And as the sample heats and becomes austenitic, you get a change. And when it cools and when transformation will begin to happen, you see other rings appearing. Okay, so this is now when transformation occurs. And another, another way of uh, looking at this is these rings, you can, uh, you can pancake them and produce uh, profiles like this, where we start off uh, at room temperature, heat it up to get austenite, and then transformation again. So we can follow the phase fractions, the lattice parameters, which give us an indication of composition and many other features by combining the dilatometer with the synchrotron at Grenoble. OK, so we designed a, a number of alloys. And bear in mind that when you design an alloy, you're not just satisfying one parameter. You have to have toughness, strength, and many other properties. Uh, it has to be manufacturable and so on. So this is a, a standard commercial material, which transforms at a high temperature, something like 450 degrees centigrade. And these alloys were designed to transform at a low temperature. And I'm going to show you uh, the information that we obtained. So of course, we can follow the phase fractions because X-ray diffraction allows you to do that very accurately. And the next slide shows curves rather like the Albury and Jones curves that I illustrated earlier, uh, where you, know, you initially get an increase in the uh, stress because you have a constrained sample which is cooling and thermal contraction and then when transformation happens it compensates for the thermal contraction and you're either left with um, compressive stress or zero stress but if you transform at a high temperature then you're left with a large stress okay so you can say that these these three alloys manage to cancel out residual stress and how do you prove this for a real world? Well, a real world is quite big and X-ray diffraction can't really penetrate, you know, 20 millimeters of material. But neutron diffraction can, and we went to Chalk River in Canada and did the following experiments. So this is the control which transforms at a high temperature, and these are our low temperature transforming welding alloys. And you can see here, everything is tensile, okay? These are positive numbers. In this case, we've left with a compressive stress of minus 600 megapascals here, and same here, minus 600 megapascals. Compressive stresses are good because, uh, you know, um, if you apply a load, then uh, th it will compensate for that applied load. Okay? And similarly, when we designed uh, another welding alloy for stainless steels, here we can show that the distortion is dramatically reduced, okay? So here we have a large distortion of seven degrees, and this is a commercial material, and this is our developed alloy where it's less than two degrees. Okay, so what I've tried to show you today is I didn't focus on applications, but you must bear in mind that if you want to create applications which are completely uh, novel and, you know, different from anything we've done in the past, then it's probably a good idea to look at the fundamental mechanisms and to use those in a quantitative manner to make predictions and test those predictions. So I will end now, and I'll be very happy to answer questions if that is allowed.